The Peter Schiff Show. Today's podcast is sponsored by Indeed. Indeed knows hiring needs to be cost effective when you're running your own business. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash Peter. Terms and conditions apply. Well, I've, I'm back in uh, Puerto Rico. I was away for most of the week. In Miami, I saw some of you at the Miami Money Show where I spoke. I gave my own keynote and uh, I, I spoke on a panel. And then I also did the Patrick Beck Davis podcast live in his studio in West Palm Beach. So if you didn't catch that almost two hour discussion uh, with uh, Patrick and a few other people, that's up on the Valuetainment website. The big news, though, I think of the day, the week, the month, I mean, maybe the biggest financial story in modern memory, which is just beginning, right? We haven't fully played this thing out, but this is uh, what I have been predicting and preparing for uh, since they started calling me Dr. Doom, since I wrote my first book, uh, Crash Proof. Uh, back in 2007. But I want to start off by talking about gold and silver and, and what they did on the week and, and today. But also, more importantly, what this move means and why no one seems to care. The mainstream media, the financial media, is not even paying attention to it, just completely ignoring not only what's happening in the precious metals market, as they have been for the entire rally, but not even questioning the significance of what's going on here. Now, I've talked about gold. You know, it's it's yellow like, like the canary. And, and in a way, it's a canary in the economic coal mine, in the monetary coal mine. You know, I wrote about that in, uh, in Crash Proof, because even back then, the price of gold was going up, going up. And nobody seemed to care. And then we had the financial crisis. And an analogy I used back then in my book was it's like you've got this canary. You know, the, the miners bring the canary in the coal mine because if there's any gas in there, the canary dies first. And so if the canary drops dead, you get the hell out of the mine, right? That's your early warning sign, right? Maybe it seems a little bit barbaric, right? You're sacrificing this canary, but better the, better the bird. Uh, you know, than, than a human being, right? So he comes in as the sacrificial, uh, not lamb, but, you know, bird. Well, gold back then, gold died, signaling that there's a big problem for the markets, but nobody cared and they would, you know, kind of rationalize explanations as to why the canary died. Well, you know, maybe he was, maybe he was just sick. You know, maybe, maybe he died, maybe he had a heart attack, you know, trying to come up with other excuses and not admitting that there's something wrong in the, in the mind and that you should get out. And really, that's what's going on now, because to the extent that the media even acknowledges that gold's gone up, because in most cases, they don't even bother covering it. But, you know, you can find some stories in the Internet. You could Google gold and you can see some stories that mention it made a record high. But all of it is explaining it um, from a geopolitical perspective. Oh, because of the Ukraine or because of uh, Israel or whatever it is, uh, that's why uh, people are buying gold. There's just uncertainty out there, all kinds of geopolitical risks, maybe the market uncertainty. So people are just buying gold as a hedge, right? <laughs> I mean, in a way, they're right. It is a hedge. But it's not a hedge against geopolitical uncertainty. It's a hedge against inflation. That's what everybody is hedging. That's what central banks are hedging. They're hedging their dollar reserves. In fact, they're getting out of their dollar reserves. They're also lightening up on euros and pounds and yen. You know, part of what's masking this problem is the relative strength in the dollar. And I say relative because the dollar is actually weak. Gold tells you what's actually happening. 
Gold today hit a new all-time record high in every single currency. Now, relative to other currencies, the dollar index was up today. But that doesn't mean the dollar was up. Gold tells you the dollar was down. What the rising dollar index tells you in an environment of a rising gold price is that the dollar is losing value. It's just losing less value than the euro or losing its value more slowly than the euro or the pound or the yen. That's what's happening. I mean, if I'm going backwards at 10 miles an hour, and there's a car next to me going backwards at 20 miles an hour. Relative to that car, I'm going forwards. But I'm not. I'm actually going backwards. I'm just going backwards more slowly than the other car. And so we don't have a strong dollar. We have a weak dollar. It's just that temporarily the dollar is less weak than these other currencies. But the, the key, the operative word is temporarily. The dollar is ultimately going to get a lot weaker uh, because of the unique problem that we have with the uh, reserve status of the dollar, which is in jeopardy, and the phony economy that we've built on top of it. You know, ironically, I was reading about a critique uh, given by uh, Ben Bernanke uh, reg about the Bank of England and all the mistakes that they made, how they got their forecasts wrong and their policies were wrong. And I thought that was very rich you know, coming from Ben Bernanke, because he made all the same mistakes as the Bank of England. It's just that he got away with it because he had the benefit of printing the world's reserve currency. The Bank of England didn't have that crutch to lie on. So yes, Powell made, I mean, uh, Bernanke made all the same mistakes that he was criticizing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, his fellow central bankers for making, but he got away with it because he had that, uh, you know, that, that crutch, get out of jail free card, whatever, that other central banks didn't have. And so the, the negative consequences of their mistakes manifest themselves much quicker uh, than the manifestation of the mistakes that uh, Bernanke made because they were kind of covered up by the dollar status and the fact that everybody just bought dollars. I mean, no matter how many we printed, no matter how low our rates were, uh, money was just flowing into the dollar by virtue of its unique position that it really doesn't deserve, but that it it had. But anyway, so um, gold, I, I woke up uh, this morning and the gold price was up about $30, $40, uh, all-time record highs at the time. We're trading just above 2,400. I mean, 2,400 was kind of like resistance all night. It didn't really move above 2,400 until just a bit before the U.S. stock market opened. But it was really, it was really trying to get get above that level. Um, and silver was up to uh, 50, 60, 70 cents. And the interesting thing is, I'm watching this show, uh, Squawk Box on uh, CNBC. And it's a three-hour show that runs from six in the morning, New York time, to nine, right? So pre-market, they're supposed to be talking about all the relative things that happened in the markets overnight and what's going on pre-market because it's all before the opening bell. So they're supposed to talk about all the important news. Now I can think of what could be more important, right? Here it is, your 6 a.m., 7 a.m. show. Stock market hasn't opened for yet, but the gold market's open. Gold's at an all-time record high, a string of all-time record highs. Silver is popping. You would think that that's the big story of the morning, especially if you understand you know, what this means, and, I, and I'll get into that. But um, you'd think they'd mention it. So I'm watching the first hour goes by. They don't even mention it. I mean, they, 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 they bring up some quotes. They talk about where the S&P futures are, the Dow futures, where the bonds are trading, dollar. Didn't mention gold. Whole hour goes by. They didn't even mention it. Hour two, no mention of gold. I mean, you can see the ticker going by, right? They didn't, they didn't erase it from their, their ticker, right? I mean, maybe that's the next thing they do. They don't talk about it at all in the second hour. 
not even to, you know, just, you know, in passing. <laughs> and then a third hour comes up and they announce next up, we're going to talk about inflation and the inflation problem, because I will get into later in this podcast, the, the CPI and PPI numbers that came out earlier in the week. But they say, oh, OK, now they're going to talk about gold, right? Because they're going to talk about inflation. Well, they do an entire segment on inflation. Nobody mentions gold or the fact that it's a record high. When gold is a uh, hedge against inflation, it's a sign of inflation. Again, like I said, with the canary in the coal mine, instead of recognizing, gee, gold's going up because of inflation, they're making up other reasons for why gold's going up, right? Like the canary died of a heart attack, right? Gold's going up because of geopolitical risk. They don't want to admit that gold's going up because of inflation, because the Fed is making a mistake, because these rate cuts are wrong because they should be hiking rates. So they do this whole segment on inflation and they don't even mention gold. Then they segue to the next segment on like what to invest in, right? If inflation is higher than we thought, what should we invest in? I'm thinking, okay, now surely they're going to talk about gold and silver. They're going to talk about gold stocks. They did a whole segment on investing with inflation and nobody mentioned gold or silver or the mining stocks. They mentioned the Magnificent Seven. That's that's all they could think of. Talk about tunnel vision. So the entire three hours goes by. (laughs) Not a single mention, let alone a discussion. They don't even mention gold. Now, as soon as the next show started, nine o'clock show, they mentioned, the guy mentioned gold is up and new highs. So yeah, but in the the three hours of squawk box, not a single mention of gold. But of course, throughout the day, they didn't have any guests on to kind of explain what was going on with gold, right? They didn't invite people like me. Of course, they're not going to invite me on, but there got to be some gold bug they can dig up, you know, out of the graveyard and bring them out to talk. You know, if Bitcoin was up as much as gold, they'd had all one Bitcoin expert after another. You know, by the way, Bitcoin was down today, down 5% or something like that. Bitcoin got killed. It was never up. Even when gold was up, Bitcoin was down, right? But um, they didn't bring anybody on to uh, uh, to talk to talk about gold or why it was up. I mean, it just got casually mentioned. Anyway, I got a quick commercial break. We're going to play this. Stick around. I'll be right back. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messages so you can contact with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agreed. Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join the 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. What I love most about Indeed is how simple it makes the hiring process and allows you to do all your hiring in one place. Candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to actually apply for your job than the candidates who see it in search alone, according to U.S. Indeed data. Indeed gets you one step closer to the hire by immediately matching you with quality candidates. And now listeners of my show can get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com com slash Peter. Just go to indeed.com slash Peter right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's indeed.com slash Peter. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, then you need Indeed. All right. So I'm talking about the, the morning rally in, in gold and silver that the media barely noticed. And if they noticed it, they had no explanation, nor did they try. They just kind of noted it as, oh, that's strange, because they would say, look, the dollar index is up, so why is gold up, right? They, they, that doesn't make sense to them. Uh, but they don't, they don't look at it as any kind of warning. You know, I did hear some people, though, on CNBC finally saying what I was saying over the last couple of weeks, which is, why is everybody talking about 
when the Fed is going to start cutting rates or how many rate cuts we're going to have when we should, the Fed should be hiking rates. And so they're now starting to say, hmm, maybe we're not going to get any cuts. They're not saying that we're going to get hikes. They're saying that's like, no, that's never going to happen. Uh, but they are starting to question uh, the validity of the cuts. But nobody is questioning the reality of the fact that they should they should never have stopped hiking, that that's what the rising gold price is is signaling, that interest rates are too low and that they need to go up, not just in the U.S. They need to go up everywhere. The Europeans, the ECB has to raise rates. The Bank of England has to raise rates. The Bank of Japan has to raise rates. Everybody has to raise rates sharply. I'm not talking about, you know, you know, manby pamby quarter point rate hikes. We need 200 basis point hikes. We need serious. The central bankers need to know that they, or let the markets know that they mean business. The central bankers have to let the governments know that they mean business. That, hey, you guys better cut your spending. You can't run these big fiscal deficits because we're raising rates. You can't afford to finance the debt. So you better get rid of the debt by getting rid of the deficits, right? That's what has to happen. That's what gold is telling you. And everybody is ignoring it. So gold at its peak was up about 60 bucks uh, early in the morning. The high that we hit was about 2,430. That, that's already better than a 20% move above 2,000. So we are way above what used to be resistance. That's now distance support. And I was saying on this podcast, in fact, the last time gold went below 2,000, I said, that's the last time. I said, this is gold's final shakeout. That's, this is your last chance to get it below 2,000. It was back above 2,000 a day or two later, and it never looked back. And now we've moved up more than 20% from 2,000. We ain't going back. So if you didn't buy gold below 2,000 when I was you know, screaming at you to buy it, well, you can't. You're not going to buy it below 2,000 again. You know, you probably won't be able to buy it below 2200. You can buy it below 2400 because it's sold off. Uh, maybe you'll be able to get to buy it below 2300, but I don't know. This rally is going to continue because A, nobody even realizes it's happening. Americans are still, still selling, they're still liquidating their gold. That's how dumb they are, or we are. I mean, I'm an, I'm an American. Um, but the, the, the rallies have really all started in the Asian time zone. All the sell-offs happen here. The same thing happened today. We got a sell-off here, although we extended the rally first. So I think some buyers came in, but then the sellers came back. So gold got as high as 20, uh, uh, 23 or 2430. But silver, silver got all the way up to 30 bucks. I've been talking about that I had a price target on silver, uh, that I thought it would hit 30 bucks. It basically did it today. I mean, it, maybe it didn't get quite get there. It might have got to 29.98, 29.99, something like that. It was up a dollar 75 or something at the or dollar 50, a dollar, a little over a dollar 50 at the peak. Huge move. In fact, over the past couple of weeks, just in the month of April, from where silver started to its high point today, silver was up better than 20%, I think. I mean, that is an enormous move in, um, in the price of silver. Now, silver also sold off and closed negative on the day, closed back down below $28 at 27.84 after almost trading $30. So you had uh, a $2 about a 10% sell off intraday uh in silver. Now, a lot of people might get scared by this big sell off and they'll think, "Oh, this is the top." Right? This is a reversal. Gold and silver made new highs and they closed lower. This means nothing. This is normal bull market action. These were not outside days. The metals held their previous day's low. So gold, even though it took out Thursday's high, never took out Thursday's low. So it's just another day. Made a new high. We got a pullback. It, it wasn't a reversal week, 
Gold and silver, silver even more so, closed the week higher. Again, unlike the equity markets or Bitcoin, uh, gold and silver had good weeks, even if they had a down day on Friday after making an all-time record high, at least in the case of, of gold made an all-time record high. Silver just made a new, a new short-term high. Also, the mining stocks. The GDXJ finally, today, finally made a new 52-week high. After all this, uh, we finally had the junior gold miners make a 52-week high. It took uh, you know, $2,430 gold uh, for it to do it. The GDX, though, never even made a new 52-week high. It was up on the day. And then, of course, the gold stocks sold off a lot more than gold uh, when gold reversed, although they shouldn't even sell off at all because they're still much too cheap. So I think this sell-off is a gift. It looked like gold was going to run away. You know, I got a little excited about that myself. I thought maybe this is it earlier this morning when I saw it going up, going up, going up. Maybe it would be up 100 bucks. Maybe silver was going to, our gold was going to get to uh, uh, 2,500 on the same day it got to 2,400. But we got the pullback. But all that means is we got the correction out of the way. We had a $90 drop intraday in the price of gold. We got a 10% drop in silver, but no technical damage has been done. No short-term uptrends have been compromised. So we got that profit-taking out of the way. And again, when the markets open up on Sunday night, Monday in Asia, they're going to be looking at a buying opportunity because the smart money is buying gold and silver. The central banks, the foreign central banks, gold has been moving from east, from west to east. So we sell, they buy. And so I believe there's going to be buying coming in to the gold and silver market. Uh, maybe there'll be an initial sell-off on the, you know, the follow-through with what we did. But I expect big buyers to come in as they have been uh, over the past several months. The sellers are here. Why? Because Americans are dumb. They're selling their real gold to buy fool's gold, <laughs> Bitcoin ETFs. The, eight, the, European, the West, or the East rather, is taking advantage of our greed and ignorance, and they're buying real gold as much as they can get their hands on. Uh, because this is a significant event. This is the beginning of the end of dollar uh, hegemony, the U.S. dominance of the global economy, the dollar's days uh, as the world reserve currency are numbered. Foreign central banks don't want dollars. They don't want treasuries, even if we pay them 5% to hold them, because they know that that's still a losing proposition, because inflation is going to be higher than that. You know, the one thing that didn't uh, reverse today was oil. Oil lost some of its gains, but it's still, it still closed up 40 cents. Oil is at just under $85 a barrel. Uh, so that helped. And other commodities have been strong. In fact, when, you know, when, when CNBC did their report on inflation, they mentioned all these commodities by name. And co cocoa, uh, coffee, I forget all the ones they mentioned. They just left out gold as if gold doesn't even count. I mean, gold is even more significant. Not that those other commodities shouldn't be mentioned. It's just that you got to mention gold too, because gold is not just a commodity. It's a monetary a commodity. So when gold is going up the way it is, it's a lot more important. It's a lot more significant than just a particular, you know, consumable commodity. Because gold is a store of value. Gold is a hedge against inflation. Gold is an alternative to U.S. dollars and other fiat currencies. And of course, it's interesting because Bitcoin is none of those. And none of the Bitcoin fanatics are, are bothering to recognize that Bitcoin was never up today. It was down all day. It was down with the stock market. It was never up with gold. It was never up with silver. And it hasn't been rising. Ever since it had that big spike, uh, Bitcoin's been going sideways to down in dollars. It's been getting killed in gold. In fact, I think as I'm speaking, the price of Bitcoin is down to about 18.6 ounces of gold. The high was 27, two and a half years ago. You know, so we're, you know, we're getting deeper into bear market territory 
<laughs> None of these Bitcoiners want to acknowledge this. Despite all the hype, ETFs, all this big rally, Bitcoin never made a new high in real money. And it may not. I said that before. And Bitcoin is looking toppier and toppier. The only thing I guess it's got now to uh, get excited about is the halving, which is a, basically a non-event as far as I'm concerned. But it is an event when you're trying to hype up Bitcoin and trying to concoct this theory that the supply is going to go down because of the halving, which is irrelevant. The, the amount of Bitcoin that is mined is irrelevant to the supply of Bitcoin because there's 19 million plus Bitcoin. There's only two more million that we're going to mine over the next hundred years or whatever it is. So the amount that's mined is irrelevant. I mean, it means something to the miners who get paid to mine it. But as far as the supply of Bitcoin, the real supply are the 19 million coins that are already out there, right? Not the, the coins that get mined. And what's more important than the supply of those coins is the demand for those coins. Do the people who hodl those coins, do they want to keep hodling them or do they want to sell them? Because that's the supply. The supply is not going to come from the miners. It's going to come from the hodlers. And why are the hodlers going to stop hodling? Well, because they want out because maybe they're afraid that the price is going to keep falling and it's not going to go up or they need the money and they have to sell even if they don't want to. But that's where the supply is going to come from. But I think, as I said, I mentioned this on the Patrick Beck Davids podcast, I think a lot of the new supply is going to come out of these ETFs. They're going to be dumping a lot more Bitcoin uh, than the miners are, are, are creating by solving math problems. And when the, the ETFs start selling, and they're going to start selling, they're not diamond hand hodlers, right? They're paper thin traders. Uh, when all these ETFs were created and the whales sold their Bitcoin, because who else did the selling? The little guy didn't sell. No, no, he's holding on, right? He's waiting for a million. Where did all that Bitcoin come from? You got all this Bitcoin in these uh, ETFs. You got to ask yourself, where was that Bitcoin before it went into these ETFs? Now, some of it just moved from grayscale to one of the other ones. But on balance, there's a lot more uh, in there than there was just left grayscale. So who sold all that Bitcoin to these ETFs? Well, I think it was some of the biggest uh, uh, whales out there who moved the money. Who knows what wallets they used? Uh, but I bet it was the big boys uh, that sold. Now, when the nouveau uh, Bitcoin speculators who bought these ETFs and who likely raised the money to buy these ETFs by selling uh, gold ETFs and gold stocks. I pointed that out real time as it was happening. When they go to sell, who's going to buy? Where's the money going to come from? Are those big uh, sellers, the whales, who unloaded their Bitcoin, are they going to be lining up to buy it back? Hell no. <laughs> they probably have more they want to sell. The last thing they want to do is buy back what they already unloaded. Uh, so there's no liquidity. There's no buying. I mean, it's going to be maybe the Bitcoin crash to end all crashes. That's what's coming. But nobody is worried about what happened uh, this week about the falling price because they say, oh, look, it's 60, 67,000, right? That's where it is now, 67,000. It's below its dollar peak from 2001. It was a false breakout. Look what happened when gold broke out. Now it's it went 20% above its old high. Bitcoin is back below its old high, and it never made a new high in gold. Now, let me get into some of the fundamentals or the, the news stories that came out that kind of drove some of the panic in the market. And again, as I've been saying, gold went up. And I, and I went over this on my last podcast, which I called All News is Good News for Gold. I said, I don't care what the news is. Gold's going up. So we got some inflation numbers. <clears throat> and I knew that regardless of the numbers, if, if they were hotter or colder than expected, I expected gold to go up. Because if there was less inflation than expected, well, the programs are, are set to buy gold on that, right? That's what they think is good for gold. Uh, because lower inflation means the Fed cuts sooner. 
But if there was higher inflation, I knew that gold would sell off initially because that's what the programs are designed to do. But I knew the real money would come in and buy it because gold's an inflation hedge. And again, hotter than expected inflation does not mean the Fed just has to fight a little harder to win. It means the Fed has already lost. Inflation won. The fight is over. And you buy gold. And so what happened? So on uh, Wednesday, we got the, the CPI. And the expectation was for a 0.3% rise, which if you annualize that is still well north of the 2% target that the Fed claims we're on a glide path to hit. The prior month was 0.4. So we ended up getting 0.4 again. So ahead of the 0.2% that people were expecting. But if you figure we've got 0.4 two months in a row for CPI, well, what if you annualize that? You know, we got it two months, so annualize it six more times. That's 5% inflation. Five seems like it's a lot higher than two. And if you're at five right now and you're trending up, right, because we bottomed out lower, we've been trending higher in inflation for, I don't know, six months, eight months. I forget. We bottomed out around three, 3.1 year over year. The year over year now is 3.5 and the year over year core is 3.8. So we never actually got even close to two and now we're headed back up. So based on that data, how does the Fed conclude that we're likely headed down the two and that they can start cutting rates? I mean, if you were objective and just looking at the CPI, you would say, oh, we better hike rates. Inflation is going up, not down. <laughs> but they're still saying, no, 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 we're expecting to cut rates. Why? Based on what would you expect to cut rates? Certainly not based on the data. The data doesn't support a rate cut. But even beyond that, Look at some of the forward-looking data. Look at energy prices, which are up, you know, better than 20% so far this year when they were down 10% last year. As I said in the last podcast, if in a year where oil was down 10%, you got a 4.1% CPI, why would you expect a 2% or even a 2.5% CPI in a year where oil is already up 20%? And we still have three quarters of the year left to go where prices can keep going up. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the summer season, which is going to uh, push up prices even more and overall commodity prices. And even the way the Keynesians look at the world with this so-called low unemployment rate and all these jobs being created. Wh why would that make a Keynesian think that inflation is coming down? Budget deficits are at record highs. Why would that be a sign? Of, of lower inflation. And look at debt, consumer household debt. You know, I did this debate when I was on the money show and I, I'm always in a debate, I was on a panel. And I make the point that uh, credit card debt is at an all time record high and household debt is at an all time record high. And another guy in the panel says, Peter, you're wrong. Household debt isn't at an all time high. I said, well, yes it is. He says, no, you're not, you're not. You're up here giving out false information. You're misleading these people. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I. so after the panel, I go to the internet and I and I Google it and I show him. And he says, oh, yeah, oh, never mind. I guess I was wrong. You were right, right? You know, it is household debt is at an all time record high. So this guy is accusing me of giving out fake information and misleading people when I was giving out accurate information and he was trying to tell everybody that I was making it up. I don't make this stuff up, right? The, the, these are facts. And since we know inflation is an expansion of the money supply and the credit, if credit is blowing out, if everybody is borrowing money and spending it, why would you think that inflation is going to come down? All that spending bids prices higher. And also manufacturing is in a recession. So we're producing less and we're spending more. I mean, what does that mean? Less supply, more demand, higher prices. Right? It's obvious. All of the data. Powell says the Fed is data dependent, waiting for a cut. But if it actually paid attention to the data, it would be hiking. That is the point. 
Now, of course, the markets, when they see this number, oh, my God, we may have to wait a couple more months to get that rate cut. There's a dawn on them that the rate cut's a mistake, that we need to hike rates. That's why I said it doesn't matter to gold. It doesn't matter when the Fed cuts rates, if they ever cut rates. Gold's going up because real rates are falling, because inflation is rising as the Fed is standing pat. And so even though gold sold off 20 bucks or so on that news, it rallied back like 40 bucks, 50 bucks the next day. So all of the decline uh, was uh, recovered. Now, of course, the media might say, well, that's because the PPI came out uh, and it wasn't as bad as expected because they were looking for up 0.3 and it came out at up 0.2. And the year over year was supposed to be up 2.3, uh, but it was only up uh, 2.1. And so they think, oh, you see that that balanced it out, which, first of all, it doesn't balance it out. But Zero Hedge did a good uh, job of pointing it out. And I retweeted uh, something that they put up. So the big reason <laughs> that the PPI was lower than expected, it was still up. But the big reason it was lower than expected was because the government claimed that energy prices were down 3.6%. So it was this big drop in energy prices that caused the PPI to go up less than expected. Except the problem was energy prices didn't drop. They went up 6.3%. So producers actually paid 6.3% more in February. Right, than they did uh, in March, rather. Producers paid 6.3% more for their energy in March than they did in, in February. But the government pretended that they, that they got that energy for 3.6% 3, 3 cheaper. And because of that pretend reduction in the price of oil, they were able to pretend that producer prices uh, rose less than they actually did. Now, well, how do they do that? Well, apparently it's a seasonal adjustment. Well, who cares? I mean, the price went up. What difference does the season make? You know, it's like, you know, you go, you go to a store or a restaurant or something and the restaurant owner really raises your prices and you're paying, let's say it's 10, 10%, 20% more than you remember. And you complain and say, well, why did you raise my price? Well, I didn't really raise your price. I actually cut your price when you seasonally adjust it because you're eating at the restaurant at a time. See, I normally raise my prices even more than this. And because I raise it a little less, well, you actually got a price cut. So be happy, right? I mean, this is all a farce. Prices went up and they want to pretend that they went down, right? So, but again, the, um, the real market knows that this, this doesn't matter. All this is noise, right? Th these government numbers don't even tell the whole story anyway. It it's all rigged. Not like that they, they don't fake the numbers. The numbers are the numbers. They rig the indexes. The indexes don't accurately measure inflation. And so you don't have to, you know, change the numbers. It's not like the CPI comes out at up five and somebody, you know, erases it and changes it and makes it up three. It's just the methodology. You know, I, I again, I talked about it. I did go look at this video. I did this video in 2013. And I was just looking at the CPI back then. So, you know, this, this magic trick has been going on for a long time. But I, I happen to notice that according to the government, in the 10 years, right, from 2003 to 2013, the price of newspapers... And, and magazines rose by 30%, according to the government. I remember thinking, that seems kind of low. Let me check. Because, you know, you could check. Because the thing about newspapers and magazines is they write the price right on the cover. Right? So I, have the, I had the internet. We had the internet in 2013. Some of you young guys might not think we had the internet back then. But we had the internet, and so I just Googled Time, Newsweek, uh, U.S. News and World Report, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, L.A. Times, like all the big newspapers and magazines. And I Googled them, the cover, and I just looked. 
at what the price was that was written there. And then I looked at what the price that's written on the same magazines, on the same covers today, which was 10 years later, which was 11 years ago, right? And, you know, I, I don't have the, you know, the formula, the methodology of uh, the CPI. I just can subtract, right? So if I see a magazine costs a dollar today and it costs 50 cents 10 years ago, I know the price doubled, right? I, I mean, I don't need a formula to try to figure it out. It's just basic arithmetic. So I compared the prices from 2003 to 2013. And I looked at what is the percentage increase, the average percentage increase of all these. I think I used maybe 20 different newspapers and magazines, right? I got about 130% increase. But the government said prices only went up 30%. What happened to the other 100%? I mean, it went into the CPI. It just never came out. Now, I have no idea. I don't know how the CPI turns a 130% increase into a 30% increase, but that's the magic of the CPI. That's why it's all a lie. Now, maybe they tried to claim that the magazines are better, or maybe they tried to claim that people don't really pay uh, the price on the cover. They, they get a deal. They get a subscription. I don't know, but the cover's the cover. The price is the price. That's an honest way to measure the effect of inflation. Again, you're not measuring inflation. You're measuring an effect of inflation. The inflation is the expansion of the money supply and the credit supply, and the result is higher prices. Now, sometimes the result could still be lower prices. They're just not as low as they would have been. Maybe prices were supposed to drop uh, by 10%, and instead they only dropped by 2%. Well, that's 8% inflation. Prices are higher than they would have been by 8%. That's a tax. I lost out on that benefit. I could have saved a bunch of money, but because the government created inflation, I saved a lot less money. And right? so the whole thing uh, is a fraud. But the number comes out, and that the, the CPI spooked the market, uh, but the PPI provided some uh, relief. But even if you looked at it closer, right, the PPI year over year. PPI, excluding food and energy, was up 2.4%. And in the prior month, the core was up 2%. And there were other aspects of this that showed real inflation pressures building. In fact, all of the reports that have been coming out. And that's why the bond market, interest rates, until today, we got a pullback, but the yield on the 10 year had moved above 4.5. The 30 year had moved above. 4.6, you know, moving closer to get back up to a five handle. A lot of people were also trying to attribute these stronger inflation numbers to a stronger economy. In fact, everybody is saying, well, you know, the economy is stronger than the Fed thinks. No, it's actually weaker. Prices aren't rising faster because the economy is stronger. It's because the economy is weaker. This is not about a strong economy. It's about inflation. It's inflation that's strong, not the economy. The economy is weak. By what measure is the economy wrong? strong? Because consumers are spending? Yeah, they're spending because prices have gone up. They're spending more because things cost more. That's why they're spending more. Where are they getting the money to pay higher prices for stuff? They're going deep into debt. They've depleted their savings. Is that what happens in a strong economy? No. You build up your savings and pay off your debt. That's what happens in a strong economy. How are workers also paying their rent, paying their groceries? They're taking second jobs. They're taking third jobs. Is that what you do in a strong economy? Hey, the economy is so strong, I had to go out and get a second job. Yeah, I don't have any more time for leisure because I'm working nights. I have a graveyard shift and then I'm working weekends. No. You don't do that in a strong economy. You do that in a weak economy. You do that because you have no other choice. You see, given the, the option of work and leisure, most people prefer leisure, right? It's like, hey, it's a Sunday. What do you want to do, right? Do you want to relax? Do you want to play around the golf? Do you want to go to the beach? 
nah, I don't feel like doing it. I'm going to go work, work at Walmart. Right? I'm going to I'm going to go ring up a cash register. I'm going to go wash dishes at the Howard Johnson's. Yeah, no. Nobody does those jobs because that's how they want to spend their weekend or their night. No, no, no. It's god damn it, I got to work this crappy job because I need the money because my full-time crappy job doesn't pay the bills anymore. Because at least a few years ago, that full-time crappy job I had at least paid me enough to cover my rent, my groceries, and I had enough time uh, to have fun on the weekends, but now I have to get a second or third job. And Biden wants to say, hey, look, I created all those jobs. Fantastic. Yeah, right. Screw you, Biden. That's what the voters are saying who have these jobs. Thank you, but no thank you, and uh, I'm not voting for you. That's what's going on. In fact, Biden and the Fed got more bad news today on consumer sentiment. All these people working second and third jobs and going into debt. Consumer sentiment unexpectedly dropped down to 77.9. It was 79 in the prior and 79.4. They were expecting a smaller drop to 79, and we dropped to 77.9. One of the reasons that consumers are less optimistic is because they are more pessimistic on inflation. The expectations for the year ahead inflation numbers went from 2.9% to 3.1. Going in the wrong direction, we're now back above three. That doesn't sound like we're anywhere near two. And Powell seems to place a a lot of uh, emphasis. He gives a lot of credibility to expectations, right? We have to make sure that inflation expectations are well anchored at 2%. Well, they don't seem anchored to me. They seem like they're drifting away from 2%. They're now above 3%. If Powell was data dependent, looking at all this inflation, looking at rising expectations of higher inflation, what is what is the Fed going to do to reverse that expectation? <clears throat> How is Powell going to tell these people <clears throat> to expect lower inflation? Well, maybe they should be raising rates. But of course, <clears throat> if they just keep doing what they've been doing, it's not enough. They need big rate cuts, hikes, rate hikes, as I said before, because they need to stop the spending. They need to stop the government from spending. And they need to stop households from spending because it's the demand that's pushing up the prices. It's the credit growth and the money supply growth that fuel that demand. So you got to reverse that. But if you do that, we have not only a major recession, we have a financial crisis. We have We have, you know, an Armageddon type scenario. That's why no one wants that to happen. Look, it's not that you need a recession to fight inflation. You don't. But you, what is needed to get rid of the inflation that's ingrained in our system now will create a recession, will create a financial crisis. That's just the predicament that we're in, that I knew that we would be in A decade or two ago, I could see this train wreck coming from a mile away. That's why I've been sounding the alarm. That's why I've been warning about it. And and everybody has ignored my warnings and laughed at my warnings because they didn't understand what was happening. I understood it perfectly. But because I understood it so well, I understood it so early. And because I was so early with the warnings and we didn't have an immediate you know, Armageddon, all the people who have no idea what's going on were convinced that I was wrong, that I'm just a stop clock, that I'm just a perma bear. Well, what's happening now is going to vindicate years and years of of economic forecasts that have actually been right. And to the people who really understand a lot of the nuances and who know all the things that I've been predicting and have read the books and have been listening to the podcast, they know how much stuff I've gotten right. And it's just a few big things, right, that have to happen. And those are the big things, right, that everybody wants to score me on. They can forget about the hundred other things that I got right, right? There's a couple of things. Well, they uh, you got this wrong. Okay, yes. But the things that I got wrong, I actually got right. You just don't know that I got them right yet because they haven't happened. But when they happen, it's going to be quick. 
And that's why I said, you know, when gold was up, yes, it didn't go up $100 today. It only went up 60 and it sold off. But the next time it's up 60, it may be up 100. It may be up 200. You don't know. We are getting close to a breaking point. And if the dollar, I mean, if gold is this strong, when the dollar is strong or less weak, right, the dollar index is going up, yet gold is still going up. Imagine what's going to happen when the dollar starts to fall. Because if gold is this strong when the dollar is going up, imagine how much stronger it's going to be when the dollar is going down. And it will go down. And if anything, the rising gold price is what will cause the dollar to go down. Because at some point, when gold gets high enough, there will be a stampede into gold by foreign central banks, uh, by uh, the public, by hedge funds, pension funds, endowments. And where are they going to get the money to buy all that gold? They're going to use dollars, right? So the dollar is going to get killed. It has no chance against gold. The supply of gold is going to grow far more slowly than the supply of dollars. And the demand for gold is only going to grow, whereas the demand for dollars is going to collapse. Uh, and so ultimately, if the dollar doesn't fall by itself, gold will make it fall. And then once it starts falling, then the gold rally is going to accelerate. And that's you know why I'm, I've been pounding the table. So we got to pull back. So those of you who have been listening to this podcast, if you didn't pull the trigger last weekend and you thought, oh my God, I screwed up, gold's running away, silver's at 30 bucks. No, I bought more silver for myself when I was in Mexico under 24 bucks two weeks ago. And it got to 30 bucks, you know, but now it's back down. Well, I say it's below 28 now. It's um, 2784. So it pulled back. The train was running out of the station, but then it came back. They forgot something. Your lucky break. Get on the train. You can call the guys that shift gold over the weekend once again, and you may get lucky. And maybe we'll have a little bit of some follow through selling early. Sunday night, get your orders in for your gold and silver, especially silver, because it's going to make a new high at 50 bucks. I mean, this is just a small taste. What you saw this morning and this week, this is just a small taste of what's going to happen. The media doesn't understand it. The financial media, just like they didn't understand what was happening when subprime blew up. And no, you know, I remember my, my, uh, I had this, uh, interview on CNBC with uh, uh, Don Luskin. And I, I like, and I started talking about, look, Don, I've been warning about the subprime problem on this show, on Cudlow, on CNBC, and look what's happened. It's blown up. These subprime renders are collapsing. And then Don Luskin interrupts me. You can find this on, on YouTube. But he says, and so what? Nothing has happened. Everything is fine. So you have to stop crying and warning about this. Everything is great. And of course, well, then we had the financial crisis, right? Because he said, oh, nothing has happened. And I said, give it time. Give it a little time. But it's going to happen. Can't you see? But he couldn't see because he didn't understand, right? You can't see if you're blind, right? And most of these people are blind when it comes to economics, when it comes to finance, right? That's why they don't know enough to realize that this is a big story, right? The reporters are entertainers or promoters. They don't really understand economics or finance. Neither do the, the media the professional financial reporters or market reporters, even guys that are teaching the subjects. I mean, most people don't under, know anything about this. And that's why it's the blind leading the blind when it comes to the public. So over this weekend, you got an opportunity to call up Shift Gold and just lock in your order and, and buy your physical gold and silver. Again, before the premiums really blow out. And then you know, not only do you pay higher prices, but you pay higher premiums. So you go to shiftgold.com, call the 800 number. You know, we're working on a, a shopping cart that should be un, 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 unveiled next month. But my guys are there. They work nice. They're hard workers, right? They'll be there uh, today, tonight, Sunday. So you can get these orders in. They'll help you make sure that, you know, you're getting the orders placed correctly. But the bigger move, the big move that's coming, is in the gold and silver mining stocks. Remember uh, when Newmont Mining got downgraded to a sell? 
And when they downgraded New York Newmark mine to a sell, it actually was below 29 that day, below 29. It closed at 38.64 today. The intraday high was 41.30. Oh, but what, a 35%, whatever that is, rise since they told you to sell it? And why did the analysts say sell it? Well, gold's at 2,000. We don't see any upside. Well, it's got up 20%. They didn't see that happening, yet it happened. And this is just the beginning. What I was saying back then is I don't see any downside. Why sell a gold stock when there's no downside in gold? Gold was at the floor. All there was was upside. And we have a lot more upside. We're just getting started. This is going to be a huge, huge rise, I think, in my opinion. I think 10, 20,000 is where we're going. I mean, I used to say 10, 15 years ago, gold was going to 5,000. And it should have gone to 5,000. It didn't. But now it's going much higher because we've printed a lot of money since then. So an equilibrium price of 5,000 no longer makes any sense. And also when you contrast it to the other financial markets, when you compare gold to the S&P, to the Dow, right? To, you know, where should it be in relation historically? So gold prices are going a lot higher. The difference is they're going to get there quickly, right? So they're not going to give a lot of people a chance to get on board because before you know it, it's just going to be a ballistic move. But the gold and silver mining stocks, those are going to be, I think, the home runs. I mean, you'll make plenty of money, I think, in gold and silver. Normally, gold and silver is not about making money. It's about not losing money. You don't buy gold and silver to get rich. You buy it to stay rich. You buy it to avoid getting poor. But the market has so underpriced gold and silver that you actually have an opportunity to make money in what's supposed to be a hedge. What's supposed to be an insurance policy is so underpriced that you can actually make money and not just preserve it. But you can make even more in the stocks. You take more risk, so you could lose more if I'm wrong. But I don't think I'm wrong. And I make it a big bet uh, that I'm right. As I've been saying, half my own portfolio uh, is in uh, gold and silver mining stocks. That doesn't even count. I don't even count my gold and silver physical. I'm talking about my, my portfolio of stocks in a brokerage account, which gold is not even considered a part of. Because I consider my gold my savings. It's not an investment. But my investment portfolio. Half of my investments, liquid investments in the stock market, are in precious metals mining stocks, right? And I, I expect five, 10 times my money, maybe more, maybe a lot more in those stocks. Now, I've expected it for a while, and I've been waiting for a while, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, all the signs are there that I'm about to get uh, handsomely rewarded for that patience. But the good news for you know my listeners who, who weren't buying, you can buy now. You don't have to wait. You can get all the benefits that I'm going to get, I think, without having to wait it out for 10 years, right? Because so much has happened. I'm surprised that you even have this opportunity. But again, it's a, a, a limited opportunity. We don't know when that door is going to slam shut, but you want to make sure you get through it. So contact the brokers at Euro Pacific uh, Asset Management. Go to europac.com as a website. Uh, give them a call. Get an account set up or on your own. Just if you have a Schwab, Fidelity, uh, Ameritrade, um, uh, IB, whatever, all these discount brokers, the big banks, you know, Wells Fargo, these guys, all my funds are there. But the, the gold fund, the Euro Pacific Gold Fund, you can buy it no load. E P I G X, Euro Pacific Gold Fund, no load. Do it yourself. Yeah, read the prospectus. You know, you can lose money if I'm wrong. Don't don't invest money that you can't afford to lose. But I think that the upside potential dwarfs. I mean, worst case scenario, every stock in my portfolio goes bankrupt and you lose all your money, which I think is an impossibility. But hey, anything could happen. But the most you can lose is 100%. But you can gain 1,000%. You can gain 2,000%. The question is, what are the odds? I think the odds of gaining 1,000% are way better than the odds of losing 100%. You know, which, you know, so I think it's worth the bet. Just don't bet more than you can afford to lose. Uh, and then if you win, well, you know, we could all celebrate together. But again, it's going to be with mixed emotions that I celebrate uh, my win on my gold stocks because I feel bad about what's going to happen as an American. And I wish there was something I could do to stop it. Believe me, I've tried, but I can't. But I'd rather profit from it than go broke by it. Right. So on the one hand, yes, I'm going to make a lot of money, I think, on my stock portfolio. But a lot of other people are going to be suffering. 
And so it's going to be mixed emotions. But I'd rather be rich while everybody else is suffering than broke and suffer along with them. Anyway, that's it for now. We're going to a lot more coming up in the next week. So make sure and continue to listen to these podcasts. Give me the thumbs up. Uh, if you like it, put a comment and tell your friends, right? The mainstream media is worthless when it comes to covering what's going on. So let's get more people listening to the Peter Schiff Show podcast and we'll have more educated and informed Americans. Bye for now. Thank you.